antithrombotics and ACS. So I'll be the last of this, of this uh, clinical trial spread talking about uh, ongoing new trials in ACS and antithrombotics, which is very much in the focus of our group as well. So um, first one is the COMPASS trial published this year. It's a trial in non-acute patients with stable atherosclerosis, so either coronary artery disease or peripheral arterial disease, 27,000 patients. And the rationale was to compare in the, in the stable atherosclerotic patients whether aspirin is as good as low-dose anticoagulation compared with a dual inhibition with aspirin and even lower dose anticoagulation. So the, the hypothesis was that maybe dual treatment with very low dose with Roxavan plus aspirin is superior to uh, aspirin treatment alone in this uh, context. So the primary endpoint, a typical MACE endpoint in cardiovascular outcome trials, cardiovascular death stroke MI was investigated and you see the kaplan meier curves here separating and there was a significant benefit in this group which is the dual treatment arm with vivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams BID, so very low dose, plus aspirin compared to aspirin alone. And there was some difference in the rivaroxaban 5 milligrams BID arm alone, but not significant. So that did not work out. So if you look at the individual endpoints here, you can see this is the combined primary endpoint, significant reduction here. Cardiovascular death was reduced as was uh, stroke. Please keep in mind, these are not AFib patients. These are patients with stable at, uh, coronary and uh, peripheral arterial disease. There was no different in MI. So a lot of thinking is now going on. How can we reduce stroke rates in patients with stable coronary disease? So on the other hand, as in all of those trials comparing more intensive anticoagulation or more intensive antiplatelet therapy uh, compared with less intensive therapy, there's an increase in bleeding. Look at this, primary safety endpoint major bleedings increased to 1.7 is the hazard ratio. You will always see this in every single trial comparing more intensive versus less intensive uh, intervention in terms of anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. So again, we have a trial showing benefits in terms of ischemic endpoints and on the other hand, more bleeding endpoints. Um, when you look at mortality, and this is something very interesting. You see this number, 0.01. That looks very good, you may say. But you have to look into the small printing here. This is not statistically significant different. So it's, not, it's not statistically significant. Uh, because the statistical assumptions that, that there is only a statistically significant difference if the p-value is like this. So it looks good, but... Formally, this is not a reduction in all-cause mortality by this treatment. So what do we do with this? And I think nobody really knows. I don't even think the company knows. So there's lots of thinking going on with this trial. What do we do with these results? So I think a very, very interesting trial. We don't really know what to do with it. There's one very in interesting thing. As Basel pointed out, um, we do not have many interventions in peripheral disease to save limbs. And this is an endpoint analysis from COMPASS showing that the male endpoint was very dramatically reduced in the combined treatment arm. That's like a 50% relative risk reduction. And look at this major amputation, 70% relative risk reduction, which is quite dramatic. And maybe this is where to go, we will see, but I think very interesting trial, hard to interpret. We will see what will happen. Another trial that's going on is covering the question whether aspirin or very low dose rivaroxaban treatment is better in patients with ACS. Gemini ACS trials. So patients with ACS who received a P2Y12 inhibitor plus aspirin were then randomized to receive aspirin or rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams together with a P2Y12 inhibitor. Okay, not triple therapy. It's like a dual th therapy, but on one hand, it's aspirin plus P2Y12. On the other hand, it's uh, P2Y12 plus very low dose rivaroxaban 2.5. When you look at this trial, first off, no difference in ischemic, uh, sorry, in bleeding events here between the two arms. And no difference in ischemic endpoints. And this was 
the, um, the reason for the company to go on. So there is a trial called Gemini ACS2, which is an outcome trial. So this was like feasibility safety. And now there will be an outcome trial to test exactly that hypothesis. 22,000 patients, MACE endpoint is the endpoint. So we'll see where we go with this. Okay, now here's something quite interesting from Munich. Um, the tropical ACS trial. So the rationale for this trial is that we know that if we have more intensive antiplatelet therapy in patients with ACS, we have less ischemic events. If you remember the PLATO trial, for example, um, or the Triton trial, but we have more bleeding events. And this trial tested the hypothesis if de-escalation therapy from a more potent platelet inhibitor to a less potent platelet inhibitor may reduce bleeding by while being safe. So two and a half thousand patients with ACS and successful PCI were randomized to receive either Prazogrel for 12 months or very some somewhat complicated design to receive seven days of Prazogrel in the beginning and switch to Clopidogrel for another seven days. And now what they did was they wanted to find out if there were low responders to Clopidogrel, which might pose a risk. So they basically tested platelet function with a multi-plate test, a platelet function test. So those patients who were low responders, so had high platelet reactivity, were continued on Prazogrel, and patients with good response were kept on Clopidogrel. So this is really testing clopidogrel versus prazogrel in terms of uh, de-escalation therapy. Now, when you look at this, 40% in this group were low responders, so quite a substantial number of patients did not respond well to clopidogrel. Um, and so the primary endpoint was a net clinical benefit endpoint composed of MACE and BARC class two or more bleeding. So this is the result taken from the Lancet paper. When you look at this, this is the net clinical benefit. You see the Kepler-Mare curves look quite favorable. This is statistically tested for non-inferiority, which was met, but not superior. When you look at bleeding, and this is what the trial was, was testing, is there less bleeding? You see that there is somewhat a difference, but it's not statistically significant. Okay, and this thing is dying here. So, but you can see here, there is some difference, but it's not statistically significant. So de-escalation therapy, doesn't really reduce bleeding. So what do we do with this? I mean, it looks, it looks, it's intriguing, isn't it? So should we de-escalate everybody? It's cheaper as well. Um, I personally think we should not do this. Just two examples, what we can compare. Look at this. We have two trials testing this scenario, 3,000 patients. We have 30,000 patients uh, in clinical trials who tested the hypothesis, more intense versus less intense antiplatelet therapy. In the outcome trials, this is the reason why the guidelines are what we have now, they're registry data, so we have a huge number of patients showing that very intense antiplatelet therapy is superior. This was tested for ischemic events, this was had power for just for bleeding events. The trial design had needed platelet function testing, so my personal view is quite clear. Uh, we should stick to this, but anyway, it's an interesting trial for sure. Okay, there's one other thing in antiplatelet therapy. Uh, the Global Leaders Trial, uh, all comers PCI patients, which means there were ACS patients and stable CAD patients receiving stents. And the experimental therapy here is a, play, is, is a, a dual antiplatelet therapy just for one month. So it's one month of aspirin followed by 24 months, two years of ticagalor. This is the experimental strategy. Do we have another pointer maybe? Because... Just a pointer. Okay, so on the other hand, the reference treatment is 24 months of aspirin and then either ticagrelor in patients with ACS for 12 months or clopidogrel in patients with stable CAD. That's great. Thank you so much. So, very interesting trial. You can, you can imagine who's trying to investigate this, but we will see if this experimental strategy will be superior to what we have now. Okay. Now, anticoagulation and platelet inhibition in patients with AF and PCI, triple therapy trials. So there are four different trials investigating this, and two of them were completed. Look at this trial, a typical trial from this research group, very complex design. I don't like this design, it's like too complicated, but I will show you now. Patients with atrial fibrillation receiving a stent, a PCI, 
50% were ACS patients, a very low number had tacrecolor, the rest had clopidogrel. So this trial tested 2,000 patients. Number one, a treatment with rivaroxaban plus clopidogrel. Here, this is the first treatment arm, which is dual therapy, versus rivaroxaban 2.5 BID, very low rivaroxaban, plus aspirin, plus P2Y12 inhibitor, triple therapy. And then classic triple therapy, vitamin K antagonist with a high INR, 2, point, uh, 2 to 3, uh, plus dual antiplatelet therapy. So when you look at this, this is not challenging with two things. Um, so it tested dual therapy with rivaroxaban 15 once daily, triple with Riva 2.5 twice daily, and triple classic triple therapy with vitamin K antagonist. Uh, there were different strata looking for one month of DAP, <coughs> six months of DAP, 12 months of DAP, so very complex design. But when you look at this, the majority had quite a long triple therapy phase. So this was really designed to make the risk in triple therapy group quite high. That's my opinion. So, and this is the result. When you look at this in the Pine AF, the groups that were comparing very low dose rivaroxaban and triple or just dual therapy were better in terms of clinically significant bleeding. So this was significantly reduced. Major bleeding was reduced, not statistically significant, but numerically it was reduced. And when you look at Ischemic endpoints, if you want ischemic safety, there was no difference, but there were very wide confidence intervals here, so you're not really sure if it's safe. But first off, there was no significant difference. Um, you have to keep in mind in trials like this with 2,000 patients, those trials cannot be powered for ischemic endpoints and let's say individual ischemic endpoints like stent thrombosis or stuff, it's not possible. You need 20, 30, 40,000 patients. Those were powered for, for bleeding, okay? But this is what we have. So second, oh sorry, and uh, this is something uh, w where you could say maybe it's not so good to have 2.5 milligrams BID rivaroxaban in the six month DAPT strata. There were more strokes in the rivaroxaban 2.5 group. And as you may know, the drug was not approved at this dose for this indication. So we have the 15 milligrams BID rivaroxaban approved in this indication, but not the 2.5 milligram dose. Okay, second trial, redual PCI. Again, AF patients, two and a half thousand patients, uh, all of them undergoing PCI. Again, 50% had ACS. A higher number had ticagalor, so that it's possible to compare ticagalor and clopidogrel patients. Design quite straightforward. Dabigatran 150 BAD with one, P oh no, with <laughs> one P2Y12 inhibitor was the majority was clopidogrel. Comparing uh, with uh, Dabigatran 110 with one P2Y12 inhibitor, comparing with classic triple therapy with warfarin. So when you look at this. It's comparing dual therapy with dabigatran 150, dabigatran 110 BAD or triple therapy. And these are the doses that were approved for stroke treatment. Okay, the other trial used a lower dose. Um, when you look at that treatment, quite straightforward. It was three months in case of DES implantation. So straightforward again. So what are the results? This is the primary endpoint is again a clinically relevant bleeding and Major bleeding in this case, and you have a 50% relative risk reduction, 11% absolute risk reduction in the Dabigatran 110 dual therapy group, and you have um, a 30% relative and 5% absolute risk reduction in the 110 group. So quite dramatic differences. And here was a statistically significant difference also in major bleedings. So with dual therapy with this drug, reduced major bleedings and clinically significant bleedings. Now what about ischemic safety? No difference, but the same holds true for this trial, of course, powered for bleeding, not powered for ischemic events, so we have to be careful. And when we look at this, there were numerically a little bit more cases of stent thrombosis uh, in the group of the bigger 10, 110. So what does it mean? We don't know, but we cannot be 100% sure. What else is there? There's another trial coming up, the Augustus trial. Same thing, patients with AF and PCI. Um, four and a half thousand patients, randomized. Number one, comparing apixaban, five milligrams BID, standard dose, 
to vitamin K antagonist, and then again randomization for triple versus dual therapies. So either aspirin or placebo. So all of these patients up here have a P2Y12 inhibitor plus anticoagulation. So that's dual therapy. And a part of these patients will receive aspirin or placebo. So this is the triple versus dual therapy. So excellent trial design. Um, and at the moment, uh, more than 4,000 patients have been, have been uh, uh, recruited. And we think that the trial will be done at the end of this year. So what else? There's another one, another trial from Munich, the approach ACS using apixaban. That's an investigator-initiated trial comparing dual treatment apixaban standard dose with clopidogrel versus triple therapy with vitamin K antagonist, aspirin, and clopidogrel, and there's some differentiation according to bleeding risk. And finally, idoxaban, the fourth NOAC, uh, also has a trial running 15,000, sorry, uh, 1,500 patients, and those patients uh, will be randomized to receive idoxaban 60 plus a P2I12 inhibitor or classic triple therapy. Uh, so we will see uh, the results at some time. So what about NOAC antidotes? Uh, a different, different topic. So this is taken, this uh, figure is taken from a publication from Alexander Niesler from our group um, about the principles, the different principles of NOAC antidotes and reversal agents. And there are three different uh, concepts. It's an antibody uh, against the bigger trend, either rizizumab. There's a, a small molecule, a magic bullet, which inhibits every different uh, NOAC, and there's a modified factor 10A that binds 10A inhibitors, that's indexin and alpha. So three different, three different concepts, and to save some time, I put it into one table. So we have siraprantag, which is the small molecule, and uh, here it's only at stage two, phase two, so phase two is enrolling, so that's very early in the clinical development. We have the idarucizumab reverse AD, published and the drug is approved and available in, uh, in uh, Europe and uh, the US. Uh, and last but not least, Andexanet has the Annexa 4 uh, study and the approval is pending. It's not there yet, but it will not be long that we get this drug. Okay, so the last that I would like to show is also anticoagulation. That's quite an interesting concept. That's uh, investigating a factor 12 antagonist uh, inhibitor. So why factor 12? Because, 11. sorry, 11, I'm sorry. It's 11, factor 11. Oh my God, can you cut this out, please? And uh, the post-processing, <laughs> it's 11, factor 11. I'm sorry, I'm not good with Roman numbers, I guess. <laughs> okay, factor 11. Why factor 11? Because factor 11 is involved in the triggering of thrombosis, but has only a minor role in hemostasis. And the thinking is that it might be good for VTE prevention, but does not produce bleeding. This factor 11, 11, 11 inhibitor. So what do we have? We have uh, phase two data. This was using antisense oligonucleotides, and you can see here in this uh, small trial and patients with knee replacement that using the antisense oligonucleotide reduced the incidence of VTE events, at the same time had less bleeding events, and uh, so now the company developed an antibody, so it's not an oligonucleotide, it's an antibody against factor 11. And uh, this has been tested in a trial called the Foxtrot study, where different doses of this uh, new drug will be compared with apixaban and inoxaparin. And uh, we will see how that goes. This is, by the way, a factor 11 uh, antibody. Okay, now, I, the last thing that I would like to show before we go to the trial stuff again is the most important publication of the year 2015 from a Finnish working group. I've just spent some time in Finland. It's pretty dark up there. Anyway, so um, this is investigating the influence of working hours per week on the risk of coronary disease and stroke. So who is, who is cardiologist? Any cardiologist? Okay, who's doing interventional? Okay, who's doing night calls? There you go. So you know what we talk about, right? So you have bad days at the, at the hospital, and then you call out at night. You work all the time, and you, know, you think you will die from heart attack, right? So you will not. This Finnish group showed that if you have a, working, a weekly working time 
of 55 hours or more, risk of CAD is not elevated. So guys, you will not die from heart attack. But look at this, if you work more than 55 hours, there's a substantially increased risk of stroke. Okay, you work too much, you will suffer a stroke. Why? The same group looked at this, look at this. Working hours and AFib risk, that is great. So when you look at this, if you work more than 55 hours, your AFib risk is higher. Okay, so maybe that's the reason. This is scientifically an association. It's not proving causal relationship, but it's very interesting. Now you think you have to work less. I mean, obviously, you will have internal motivation to work long, and you come to Brussels, you know, to spend your time with us because of your internal motivation, and maybe some external motivation from your bosses <laughs> who tell you to work even more. I don't know. Um, so you think you might have to work less and then everything is good. I will show you something else. So working hours and the risk of divorce. And to make it short, there's a sex difference, okay? So there's no difference whatsoever for females. Okay, this is for physicians, by the way, only for physicians. Um, but when you look at men, there's a dose relationship. The longer the working hours of the week, the less, the lower is the risk of being divorced. So now you can think of what you do, okay? Stroke, divorce, you can think about that. I have to leave you alone uh, with the decision on that. Okay, thank you for this trial parade. And by the way, please join our working group. We're a great, great bunch of people. And uh, if you want to do this, you can do this online with this internet address. You may have to send us something like your bank account number and stuff. <laughs> and a little CV so you, we know that you're great people and then, then you can join us. Thank you very much.